Ja nüüd ja nüüd lähme edasi detailsemalt juba rohelise idee valdkonnaga. Mis asi on roheline idee? Selleks ma palun lavale Herra Graham Vickery. The stage is all yours. Thank you very much. I can't see anybody very well back there, but I know that you're all um, anxious to know about green IT following the, the minister parts for a um, very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to, to say I'm very pleased to be here. Um, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to Minister Parts, who's, who's, who's come and he's gone, but he'll be coming back, I understand. Um, and I am going to follow up just very briefly on something that the Minister said, which I think is very interesting. He mentioned social media as the other half of today's session. And I think the important thing to remember is that um, after the collapse of the COP15, the Copenhagen Climate Talks, and let's face it, we're not very optimistic to what, about what is going to happen in Mexico uh, in, uh, uh, this year. So I think we have to keep in mind that if we are going to make progress in terms of improving environmental performance, it's going to be a bottom-up process as much as, as it's going to be a top-down process. And that means social media are going to be very important. All different ways of sharing information, which is going to be new, new information, are going to be the key to the way we're going to improve our environmental performance. And this is where I think Estonia, because you're a highly networked, um, highly um, e-everything economy uh, with a strong IT sector has a huge advantage or a huge relative advantage um, at a global scale. And I think we need to keep that in mind. We're not talking about um, an IT solution in one corner of the economy, which is then going to be given to everybody else. We're talking about using the social media and the social networking in a different way. So that was my ad lib beginning. Um, the other important thing to keep in mind, uh, which I think is key to this, is that we're not talking about doing necessarily um, old things smarter. We're talking about doing new smart things. So when we talk about green IT, we shouldn't just think about such things as green grids, which is all the popular area in the United States, for example, but that is just making um, standard electricity grids, which are very dumb, smarter. We have to think about doing smart new things as well. And again, I think this is very important to keep in mind for um, Estonia and the IT sector and your potential being positioned where you are. So this is a very complicated graph. I always like to start off with a very complicated graph, but there are two important things to keep in mind in this, and you'll have the distribution of my, my slides afterwards. The important things is the red dotted vertical line and the red solid vertical line. And all of the, bar, the bars, and you see the different colored bars, but this graph shows you very uh, clearly, if you look at the top left hand corner, that is how um, profitable, if you like, or how economically viable is um, conventional onshore oil from the Middle East. And you can see that's the one which is the lowest, which means it's the lowest cost. It is about the only thing which is really hyper-competitive at the moment. And this is one of the challenges we have when we're talking about green IT. We're talking about a situation, about an um, energy situation, which is it's still biased very much towards conventional energy sources. That means um, producing very large amounts of carbon dioxide and and related greenhouse gases. And this is the challenge, that at current oil prices, even though they've gone up, they're now about 70 or so dollars a barrel, which is the red vertical line, not the dotted line, the red vertical line. Nothing really competes against oil and gas from established areas. And so if you look down the, the line, the second block of, um, of arrows, uh, things like oil shale, um, for example, which is just competitive at current prices, except Again, um, Venezuela, um, where some of the, the oil shale and oil sands are very, very competitive. If you look right at the bottom left-hand block there, um, you can't read the writing very well, but the, the, the one which is just goes through the, the dotted vertical red line there, that is Brazilian sugarcane. And Brazilian sugarcane is very competitive, so Brazilian ethanol is very competitive at um, low oil prices, around about 50 to $60 a barrel and very competitive at uh, certainly at $70 or so a barrel. And it's interesting. 
it's at the bottom, it's been cut off the graph. Um, uh, European um, beetroot based, better Ave based um, ethanol is not really competitive even at current prices and that's something to keep in mind which means it needs to be subsidised which means we need to think about smart ways, smart new ways of generating for example um, different alternative energy sources. If you look on the right hand side of the, of the graph, the, the blue, blue lines, coal is not very competitive, new coal sources are not very competitive at current oil and gas prices. So they are the top, um, the very top bar. The second bar, second blue bar, is um, carbon capture and storage. That's what means that you use coal to generate electricity. We still rely on coal very largely to generate electricity all over the world. Carbon capture and storage, which is everybody, something that's been talked about for 20 years or more, is not very competitive either. And so it's, uh, you can see, if you look down, the, down to the bottom set on the right-hand side, Onshore wind is the, is, the, is the hopeful story. Onshore wind is quite competitive. Onshore wind does not need, need to be subsidised. Onshore wind works. And so you have got a sustainable energy source along with Brazilian ethanol. So again, that means that we're getting there, but we need to think of a lot more smart new solutions and not keep on thinking about um, how we might make um, the conventional sources more efficient because con conventional sources are the world beat at the moment at current prices. So that's the, that's the larger context. We have to keep this in mind at all, all times. And that's why I will emphasise over and over again we have to think about smart new things if we're going to battle climate change, if we're going to battle despite the snow out there. It's wonderful. The, the snow is beautiful. I understand this is quite late for you, but uh, uh, it's gorgeous at the moment. Talon has never looked better. Um, so that the other thing to remember is a lot of money is being poured into um, green and clean technologies. So about 20% of US venture capital, about four to five billion um, dollars per year. And just in, in startups and venture capital, this is the, 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 the new things, this is the new ways of thinking, uh, is going into um, new technologies in the United States, four to five billion dollars per year. So that is the, the blue lines, that's about, that's how much per quarter. This data is through to the end of 2009. There's no newer data available in the world. Um, but you can see that with the economic crisis, there was an amazing slump. Um, that's the, 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 like the vertical drop, the dive in venture capital. The blue um, line you can see, suddenly there's no venture capital going into clean technologies. That's partly due to the crisis in the United States and partly due to the fact that people started to look elsewhere for where they might put their money. And it uh, jumped up again in the third quarter of 2009, and now it's dropped again. So again, it's something to do with oil prices, it's something to do with where prospects are, it's something to do with whether there are any really new ideas coming along. And again, I'll emphasise, we have to think of, of smart new things, and that is, will, um, be one of the determinants of, of how much money goes into this sector and um, what new smart things come along. Now, Minister Parts very, very well expressed, I think, some of the um, hopes and worries about green ICT. Is this just going to be um, another hype? Is this something which is just going to come and go? Should we actually just sort of forget about it or should we think more broadly? And this is the main object of my talk today, that we need to think of green ICTs in a broader context. And I've put three different ways of looking at this. Some people have a five um, level classification, but I think a three level classification is enough. And I think it captures all of the ways we need to look at green, uh, green ICTs, or ICTs and the greening and improving of our environment and the way we live. The first is the easiest. What we do is we make our computer screens more efficient, we make our mobile uh, networks more efficient, we make our data centres more efficient. Data centres are the fastest growing user of electricity in the world at the moment. That's every time you log on to the internet and do interesting things, you're starting to use a lot of energy because um, Google, as we know, has got thousands of, of data centres around the world. There's, I don't know how many hundred thousand data centres worldwide now and they use a lot of electricity. They are not optimised, they all run at 18 degrees centigrade rather than 27 or 28 degrees centigrade. 
they run all the time, they could be turned off. They, you could probably save at least half of the energy in data centres by being cleverer. But that is only a part of the story. That has to be done, but, and that requires some innovation and some smart thinking about conventional things, about how you run a data centre and how a, a central processing unit works. But the more important area I would argue today as well is what, we, what I've called enabling effects. And that is we should think about using information and communication technology to make our systems smarter and to do smart new things in terms of our systems, in terms of our buildings, in terms of our urban environments, in terms of our um, transport systems and the way we get around, whether we do actually need to travel as much as, as we do, whether teleworking really has come to stay. We've been talking about teleworking for 20 years and still most of us do it occasionally, but we don't do as much of it as we could. Um, things like video conferencing, all those sorts of things which is, is about social behavioural change. Um, but we need to think about how we um, adopt smart systems and they all run on software and sensors and new ICTs and more efficient ICTs. It is really, it's a it's an, a, an E or an I, depending on which you like to, to use, but it's an E world we're talking about when we're talking about smart systems. It is software and, and um, smart um, ICT applications. But thirdly, and this is where I come back to, I think, the Minister's discussion um, of social networking, the really important change is going to be come from us. It's going to be bottom-up, it's going to be consumer and user-led, and it really is, is, has to come from the bottom. And that is behavioural or systemic change. It is not the same as saying, well, um, what we will do is we'll have a smart meter at home and that will just decide when we turn our electricity on, our ele electricity off, and we're all going to be virtuous. What it is going to be is something along the lines of, we will have some, something like a smart two-way meter, talking about electricity, which will decide when we're going to uh, feed in our electricity, which is, comes from our solar panels or geothermal or whatever own private sort of um, uh, input into the, into the energy grid, how that is going to work, when it's going to work, um, how we decide we're going to work that, whether it's going to be personal, whether it's going to be collective, and also we, we need to make decisions about if it is a, a very windy day, what can we possibly optimise in terms of making sure that the sustainable wind energy, the wind turbines, we can use that electricity in an optimum way because that apart from pumping um, water up into dams, let it rain, run down again, which is not so easy in Estonia because there's not so many high dams, um, there are not so many ways of optimising the use of um, sustainable energy in terms of um, photovoltaic or wind energy and we have to keep that in mind that we have to think more about how we can change our behaviour to use all of these smart solutions better. And that's the hardest part, but it's the part where we need to think about, think about most. And again, it will be helped by smart software and smart solutions of various sorts. Um, the factual basis for my talk today is three different surveys which we did at OECD. OECD is very good at um, doing surveys, so we do surveys of everything all the time. We do lots of medium-term macroeconomic um, projections. Uh, for example. But this is three, three different surveys which we've done in the last year, um, yes, the last year, from starting at the, st at the start of last year. And first of all, we said, well, everybody talks about green ICTs, everybody talks about this area, but what does it really mean? Um, behind the rhetoric, what are people doing? What are governments doing? And what are industry associations doing? And what we looked at were national government programs, and we looked at industry initiatives when they were tended to be broader than one country, at least covering one country and not narrow. And so we looked at um, direct and enabling effects, uh, the words I used before, so this is direct effects of ICTs and looking at enabling effects of ICTs. So it's looking at the direct effects, can you make your systems more efficient? And enabling effects, can you actually think of applying ICTs more broadly? And then we looked at environmental impact effects, global warming, energy use, toxicity, res, uh, resource depletion, land use, water use, a whole lot of things. It's not only energy, it's a lot of other things as well. And we looked at this across some various um, life cycle phases, R&D, all the way through to the, the end of the life cycle. So 
complicated graph. The important thing about that graph is that you see a lot of activity in terms of research and development, in terms of government programs and industry uh, associations. This is just looking at the government um, policies and programs. The industry ones tend to be clustered down in the application area, the, third, the second group there. Um, but you can see that largely when you put direct effects and, and, and both together, which are mostly direct effects, most of the, the applications are looking at the direct impacts of ICTs. They're still narrowly focused on ICTs and data centres and making your screens more efficient and you're using these things more efficiently. But they're, they're distributed reasonably well in terms of what, they, what is discussed. But the, 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 the situation is that when you look at what these are targeted on in terms of, of where most of the programs are targeted, they have tended to be on energy use during use. So this is using your mobile phone or using your network and directly, this is ICTs in a narrow sense, and focused on just reducing energy use, that's making these things more efficient, which is very laudable, very noble, but it's only a very small part of the picture. The other area was in waste disposal. This is partly driven by um, what has happened in the European Union with the, the ROHS, uh, the Reduction of Hazardous Substances um, Directive and the WEEEE, the, the um, Waste um, Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive get that right. Um, and so that basically they have actually focused people's minds, but focused narrowly on ICTs again. I would argue still that we need to think more broadly and I think that's very important. So you can see that really people are not thinking much about R&D and design or manufacturing distribution of this equipment. They're thinking mainly about use. And if you look at life cycle analysis, um, which is quite difficult to do, but if you look at the life cycle of your average screen, your average mobile phone, um, your average uh, whatever sort of electronic or ICT equipment we're talking about, you'll see that as much energy and now more energy goes into actually producing these things, distributing them and then disposing of them. And it's the same with the actual um, the other sorts of waste and resource use as much goes into areas outside of use as in, into use. And you can see, apart from disposal, I'm trying to reduce to toxic substances, um, most of the concentration of the measures of what governments are doing and what industry associations are doing is just in fact reducing energy use while you're using it with the equipment. And so this graph and the next one are on exactly the same scale. So you go to that one and you can see this is enabling effects, far fewer, still focused on energy use, that's the second red, um, second red from the, from the right um, uh, column, and you can see that's still the most important one. So if you go back, this is um, in a, uh, use directly of ICTs, same scale, rather little uh, interest in the broader picture. So this is the start of 2009. Um, this is just showing that, in fact, Europe um, you don't have to look at the numbers particularly, but the important thing is you can see that all of these policies are clustered in the top, and they, uh, which is about energy use, and it's about um, uh, particularly during energy reduction during ICT usage. And again, it doesn't matter where, where you're looking, you're looking at Europe, you're looking at North America, you're looking at Asia, it's, it's much the same. There's, if you look at the, just the numbers, the, the numbers are highest in those areas. But that's looking at about 50 or so different policies and programs. Again, if you look at enabling effects, it's the same, the same sort of scatter. There's a little bit more um, scatter across different areas, but the numbers, it still means United States um, and uh, Korea, Japan and Europe are much the same in the sense that globally there's been a, a huge interest in just making your ICTs more efficient. And that's where I would argue that that is very important, but it's not the whole story. You have to think much, much, much more broadly. So we looked at all of these initiatives, start of 2009, and what we said was that yeah, very good, um, people's hearts are in the right place, but um, we're probably still not thinking of the big picture enough. Um, and more importantly, when you look at detail of these programs, very few of them have a target which is measurable. Very, very few say, well, we are going to 
reduce the use of our equipment or we're going to um, make sure that our smart applications across the economy in terms of, say, smart um, grids or smart whatever, um, that we've got some very precise targets. We're going to reduce energy use or we're going to reduce the use of, of toxic substances or we're going to reduce something by 20%, 10%, X% percent, so many tonnes or whatever. Very, very few of these measures actually uh, have precise targets. And that would be one of our criticisms. You cannot actually have a policy or a government or an industry initiative unless you have a target. I mean, seriously, um, it's very, all very nice to say we, we're going to improve the environment in a general sort of way, but you have to have some sort of targets. And very, very few of these policies or programs from industry associations have targets. And secondly, um, Governments are better than, than, than industry associations in general. Industry associations tend to say this is very important, we will re reduce, we'll be all very virtuous. But at the end of the day, they have even fewer targets. So governments are slightly more virtuous uh, in the sense that they have more targets, somewhat more targets, not very many, but some. Um, and the, the third point is that, this, and even when there are targets, there's very little evaluation. So what you get is, you get a situation where you, even where you have targets, you have very little evaluation. You don't say, well, in five years' time or two years' time, I'm going to come back to these policies and see whether we've reached these targets. Most of these policies programs say simply, um, we are going to do better uh, and we're going to be all very virtuous and we're all going to feel much better for this, but without hard, hard targets and even less evaluation. And I think this, is, this was our big criticism. I think we handed out to you a small um, green cover booklet, only partly green, uh, with, on green ICTs about government um, policies and programs. And that summarises in great detail the information that I've just um, presented to you. Now, we're moving forward. We had a crisis at the end of 2008. You know this better than, than most, most countries, financial uh, sector over enthusiasm, particularly in, in real estate and construction, much the same everywhere in the world where there's been a huge boom and a crash. Um, we've all learnt, some people are learning more than others. Um, and so we, ha we had to have recovery packages. The interesting thing is that apart from throwing huge amounts of money at the banks, which is the classic way of getting over a financial crisis, um, a lot of countries said they were going to introduce broader measures, which I think is very interesting, rather than just throwing money at the banks and hoping to mop up the money afterwards, um, you actually see a lot of programs on things such as smart grids, smart uh, transport, smart systems, broadband. For example, in the United States, where broadband has been lagging very badly in, in um, some countries, Australia the same, broadband has been very, very slow to disperse um, pro uh, properly, unlike in Estonia. So you've had a lot of those sorts of packages as well. And a lot of them, 16 out of the 23 countries we counted, we, like I said, we count these things, um, that a lot of these programs rely on, on information and communication technology, uh, which again is very interesting. So we have moved forward and it's relied on information and communication technology quite broadly. So you've had also um, programs such as Smart Health in the United States where the health system is lagging quite badly. But you've also seen smart solutions across the economy. It's been realised in at least the programs, the announced programs, that we need to have smart systems, um, smart applications in buildings, houses, um, transport systems, and quite a lot of money has been devoted to that. I won't go into the details. The problem with the crisis and recovery packages uh, in general is that the crisis comes along, you save the banks, that's the, the easy part, it's the aftermath which is the hard part. And um, a lot of these programs, which is the, are the hard part, take a long time to get moving. So a lot of these programs still intelligent tra transport systems, intelligent buildings, intelligent um, electricity systems are only still being worked on. In the United States, for example, we've had a broadband plan designed to improve broadband coverage um, across the economy. Um, there's still been no money actually distributed to the people who are going to build the new broadband networks. So this is 
one and a half years on and we still haven't distributed money because governments have to be careful, have to be seen to be being um, responsible. So that means these things take time. Um, but the heartening thing is there is a lot more interest in what is basically smart systems in terms of the recovery packages. It wasn't only banks, it was also smart activities outside the banking sector. So, and many other of these programs have non-financial measures as well. We have stricter energy efficiency requirements. We have setting mandatory goals, trying to actually set targets. My criticism from before has been listened to in a way, um, I'd like to think. But um, the more important thing is that there is much, usually harder targets or harder um, goals and ideas of possibly evaluating. So that's early 2009, so we've moved on a little bit from our previous review. Now, you cannot read this, yes you can, um, screen is big enough. The important thing in this graph is we've just completed, and Estonia has replied to our questionnaire, thank you very much, um, uh, a review of ICT policies um, in our OECD countries. So this is 27, 28 countries have responded. Um, in detail. And the thing that was very interesting is that we asked questions about what sort of policies, and that's the top, top rank, what areas have the highest, there we go, the highest priority in terms of the crisis. That's the top set of bars. And the interesting thing is um, of, of the countries, the numbers on the right hand side are just the number of countries which have responded. and it shows that countries are interested in ICT skills, which I think is important for a country like Estonia, very, very important. Where are the skills going to come from to support your high-tech ICT uh, firms? How are you going to reorganise your whole um, training, education, immigration, whatever system? And most countries put that on the, on the top rank of policies which have changed due to the crisis. Equal ranking was broadband. A lot of countries lag quite badly, not like Estonia, a lot of countries lag badly so that the broadband need, needs to be um, uh, looked at and paid attention to. Uh, but the second area is in what we call the enabling environmental impacts of ICTs. That's the, that's the red third of that, that level, um, the red line. And that is very interesting because it shows that using ICTs to um, information communication technology to apply across the economy has moved up significantly during the crisis. So it's not only the crisis you know, packages, but also in general in terms of government policy. And I think that's very interesting. And you can see that it's second. I mean, the numbers don't really matter very much because that's just the number of countries that have replied. Um, but it's moved up in the second group. And it's moved up from where it was in terms of overall priorities. If you ask the question, what were you doing in general, um, then you see that the enabling effects of ICTs, the application of smart policies was down around about number five. But in terms of what has changed, what are you doing differently, it's moved up to number two. And I think that's very, very significant. In terms of um, so the sort of work we're doing, we're doing a lot of work in this area. This is just a, a bureaucratic um, administrative way of saying that we're promoting enabling effects much more than we were, which responds partly to my criticism, although I still have the same criticism, um, and also that we're looking at both direct and um, enabling effects, more at enabling effects. Some examples, a lot of examples around, um, and I would say that it's interesting to see the sorts of things that are being done. Germany has um, a smart e-energy program which is very ambitious to try and improve energy use. Um, there are other areas, smart grids, etc., smart cities. Australia is trying to improve its performance. Australia, large, large country. Um, I'm Australian, so I can criticise Australia or be nice about it. Um, very large country, very dispersed. The US model, so that meant you have large dispersed, dispersed cities, um, a lot of energy use, particularly for um, air conditioning. Everybody uses cars, trucks, whatever, so it's not very efficient. Everything is coal-fired um, uh, energy production, and so that, um, that means that it's, it's quite inefficient. Um, so that, that means that things like smart grids and smart cities are very important in a country like 
Australia to try and change the way things are done. Um, smart metering is everywhere. Um, I'll just have a little aside about smart meters. Um, Italy has had smart meters for a long time um, because of NL, the, the, the electricity company. They've had them for about seven or eight years. And this, gets back to, this will get back to my point about behavioural change. About 25% of the population in Italy are obsessed, if you like, or they use their smart meters a lot. They keep on adjusting them, try to reduce their electricity consumption and try and be good citizens and try to really reduce their electricity consumption because it's cheaper as well. About another 25% um, use them occasionally. They're not obsessed by this, they, but they use them occasionally. Uh, and it, this, this, this has positive effects to them. But half of the population, after seven or eight years of experience, don't care, basically. And I think this is the important thing, that we have to think about how you can have systemic change so more people in general, either through automation or through awareness raising, care about these things. Um, so there are a lot of, you know, there's, there's increasingly programs that look at enabling effects, which I think is a very good thing. And a, cro a lot of cross-discipline things as well, and a lot of um, uh, areas such as improving research, etc. Direct environmental impacts, I'll just say one thing, and that is, again, not much transparency in government programs. One of the few countries which has tried very seriously to improve performance has been the United Kingdom, where they have, in terms of equipment use at government level and equipment disposal, they send everybody a questionnaire, a very, very complicated questionnaire, and all the, all the government departments have to fill this out, and now they're getting down to sub-national departments, and everybody fills this out, and then they rank the government departments from green down to red, and then they publish this. This is put on, on an internet site, so you can see that this ministry is very efficient, and this ministry is, is not so efficient, this one's terrible, and they just publish this information. And that's, I think, is a very important way of saying we've got targets uh, for the government, this applies to all of the government, uh, and, and not only do we have targets, but we're going to evaluate this, and not only are we going to evaluate this, but we're going to tell everybody about your evaluation. And I think that's very important. The interesting thing is, the, the problem is, of course, or the challenge is that it's only for government departments and it's only for the use of ICT equipment. It comes down to what you do in terms of your laptop computers and your mobile phones and, the, and how much you use the internet, etc. And it's only in the, in the government, it's very narrow, but it's a very, very good start, I think, and it's a very good example to follow. Um, finally, my final point, um, OECD, we're working on a recommendation. Um, we've said that um, it's very important, this is an area where ICTs should be able to Im improve their performance and we should be able to think about ICTs more broadly. So we've got a 10-point plan. We always have a 10-point plan, if we can, um, and uh, it's sort of biblical in a way. So that um, we've got a 10-point plan and it's very, very simple and it's aimed at governments because we say that's where we OECD have leverage and where we have the most expertise. And we've said 10 very simple things, and they're, this is the first five. We need to coordinate all these policies and programs. Everybody has to coordinate, because at the moment we've had ICT policies, climate change policies, environmental policies, nobody talks to anybody, they all go their own way, the environmentalists are, are cross with everybody, um, the climate people are even crosser with everybody, the energy people say, well, we're in the business of actually making sure everybody's got electricity. The ICT people say, well, it's all going to be driven by software and nobody talks to anybody. So we say that just number one, if everybody talked to each other and you had a coordinated plan about how this fits together, then most governments could actually do a lot better and most industry associations, etc. That's number one. You know, much more horizontal talking needs to be done. Secondly, life cycle perspectives. As I said, even in the ICT area, and it's the same everywhere you think of ICT applications, a lot of the effort, energy, pollution, waste, energy use, is not in the actual use. It's somewhere else. It's in building these things, it's in disposing of them, it's in other areas. And we have to think of where the peaks are and where, what we need to tackle next. Third point, research. Governments spend a lot of money on research, not so much on innovation, that's for the private sector. But research, a lot of interesting things can be done in terms of where governments put their research money. Uh, I, was, I was talking this morning with uh, 
some of your colleagues, um, uh, one of your colleagues from Skype, and he was talking you know, again about ICT skills, and I think it's very important. This is the key. It's, we're talking about people, we're talking about what people do, and where you get your um, human resources from, and we say that green ICT skills, not necessarily in the ICT sector, but across the economy are, are, are vital. Fifth point, but not by far the fifth in order of priority, increasing public awareness. Governments can do a lot about trying to make sure that consumer associations, for example, try to um, make people more aware. Not that people need to be made more aware, but that information is available much more broadly about how we can all improve our performance. Because it, as I emphasised, and I'll emphasise again, this is bottom-up process. And we all have to, have to improve our performance. And this is the last five points. Um, best practices. There's a lot of very, very interesting things happening. There are a lot of very good examples, I'm sure, in thank you, um, a lot of very, very sh um, good examples in Estonia, in all countries, um, of good practice. Just different, often very simple ways of using current technology better or thinking, as I said before, about smart new things, some smart new things that deserve looking at on a, on a broader scale. Um, there's a, a, a saying that I heard from the European Commission when I was talking with them a few weeks ago, saying, well, you've got all these pilot projects, you've got these wonderful pilot projects. Um, and uh, um, they, I said, uh, well, you know, what happens after the pilot projects? And they said, unfortunately, in most cases, nothing. So we have 300 pilot projects and they're all terrific and that's it. So it's like um, we have, we're talking about scaling up. We've got a lot of, a lot of scale but no up. And so the problem is that there's a lot of interesting pilot projects which need to be um, thought about more broadly. Uh, so that's encouraging best practices. Um, sixth, seventh point, governments leading by example. Um, again, Denmark is very interesting uh, in the sense that the Danish government host to COP15, they decided that if the government was going to say anything about green ICTs or green behaviour in general, then they should start with themselves. So they had some projects about reducing electricity use by 5% a year with some hard targets measuring this and saying, well, governments can't go out and preach to everybody and not improve their own performance. So I think that governments can say, well, this is the way we've improved our in performance, made, make this building work more efficiently, tell everybody about it, how you can make this more efficient, how you can make everything more efficient, how you can make it um, more environmentally friendly, the seats and everything can be disposed of better. It's not ICTs, but it could be. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing which needs to be thought of more, more clearly and governments can actually improve their own performance. Public procurement as well. All governments buy a lot of things, a lot of everything. They could buy it a lot smarter. Um, finally, two things that I mentioned before. Encourage me measurement. We have to measure what we're talking about better. And finally, we have to have targets and evaluate better. So on that note, I'll get back to where I started and I'll say that we need to think about not only doing what we're doing smarter, we need to think about doing smart new things as well. And it's bottom up, I believe. Thank you. Enne veel, kui me vaatame Twitteri kontot, if there are any questions from you? Kas on saalist küsimusi? My time's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, heidame pilguga meie Twitteri kontole, kas on mõttekäike tekkinud. Uh, mis roll on rohelises innovatsioonis sotsiaal- ja käitumisteadustel? Ah, I think I covered that. So, um, at least I hope I covered it. Um, I, I think that we need to actually talk much more, and this, this is one of my first points, and I think it's a point that Minister Parts um, used, pointed out as well when he's talking about social networking. We need to think about changing social behaviour, and social behaviour, again, is not a top-down process, it's a bottom-up um, process, a very complicated process. You can't manage it, but you can encourage different sorts of, of um, exchange. We were working very closely at, at OECD with our consumer policy committee. This is consumers trying to encourage consumer, better consumer behaviour. And I think that is very, very important in terms of 
trying to work out how you can encourage different sorts of behaviour um, and what sort of information exchange seems to work very efficiently at spreading inf inf information. The problem is that it can easily turn into a top-down process and of course you know, we collectively have to work this out ourselves. But that means that you know, sociologists, social structures, just thinking about how behaviour is, is changing or is not changing, how people respond to such things as today is a windy day with a lot of sun, this is the day uh, um, because that means we've got a lot of wind turbines tur turning, we've got a lot of photovoltaics um, and pushing electricity into the grid. Is this the day when I do all of, my, all of the things that I can elect to do um, when electricity is cheap? You can do partly, you can do, partly this can be done by pushing down prices, but partly it's, it's just um, trying to work out how people react to different sorts of, different sorts of um, price and social signals. So I think my answer is, to that terrific question, uh, that my answer is this is essential. Essential to ta have a very, be very aware of, of, I won't say users or consumers, I'll say how, how social behaviour um, can and is changing. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, tahaksin paluda me hea külalise mõttekäikuga sellele mõttele, et kas um, Eesti kui nii väike ühiskond uh, omab mingisugust eelist näiteks, kui me hakkame rakendama just kui neid kümneid soovi, kümmet soovitud punkti, soovitatud punkti või ei ole IKT, rohelise IKT temaatika rakendusel väiksusel mingi eelist? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I think small open economies, which Estonia is, is you know, a small and open economies, have, a, have an advantage um, simply because I think, um, particularly in a, a society in a country such as Estonia, which is very, already is very, very networked um, in a very egalitarian sort of way. Everybody does pretty well everything online. Um, so that means that you already have, as a country, um, the level of networking and exchange of information and use of ICTs, the infrastructure and ICT applications is very high. So that, to me, means that you have a comparative advantage, and a comparative advantage because of your, basically, your, your I or E structure is very advanced. And secondly, being a small open economy, that means that um, you can, potentially use that the, the, the smallness and openness as a, turn that as an to being an advantage. Um, you can develop, I think, a lot of interesting experimental um, tools and think about you using them because you can network them across your, your economy very rapidly and then potentially export them. So I would say that um, Estonia potentially um, is in a very strong position. I know that this is early days for you and you haven't really thought about some of these things, but I would see this as potentially a very interesting growth area for the economy, um, simply because you are well positioned in terms of infrastructure and I think things like education, population and looking outwards. And this is one of those areas where an open economy, I think, can um, lead, if not lead globally, be one of the leaders globally. Thank you very much. With uh, some effort. <laughs> thank you, thank you.